Good morning, everybody. Um, my name's Nicholas Tolovy, and um, it's a great pleasure to be here in France. Uh, despite the best efforts of my French teacher at school, I still love coming to France and speaking French. Um, yesterday, I found that as I drank more wine, I became better at speaking French that in the evening. So um, it's a nice opportunity for me to, um, to murder your beautiful language uh, when I come over here. Um, so uh, my talk this morning, uh, Python in Education, Politics, People, and programming. Um, and uh, obviously, I'm from the UK. Um, and uh, in the UK, uh, I'm a freelance Python programmer. Um, and I, I know quite a number of you here. Uh, but in case you don't know me, um, I'm actually a classically trained musician. So uh, here's a picture from many years ago of me in action. Uh, and I'm a tuba player. I also play the piano and the organ. Um, uh, I also read philosophy when I was at university. And I've written books for O'Reilly. And uh, having been a musician, uh, I, do what, I did what every musician does when they can't find work, and that is I became a teacher. Um, now, uh, there is an education track happening today, um, and I was told there would be people um, from French uh, educational establishments and what have you here. Um, so I just wanted to see uh, what sort of people we have in the room. So could you just put your hand up if you identify yourself as a Python developer? That's what you do. You're a software developer. Okay, that's most of you, which is unsurprising. And those of you who, uh, who are here because you're a teacher or you're interested in education. Okay, good. That's a significant minority. Fantastic. Okay. Okay, so uh, this is me on uh, my first day as, uh, as being a teacher. I just passed what was called the NQT year, the newly qualified teacher year. And this is my form. And uh, I was a secondary school teacher. And so these, are in, uh, these kids are in year seven in the UK, which means that they are 11 turning 12. Um, and of course, uh, you don't have this in France, uh, but in the UK, we, we tend to dress our children up in strange uniforms. Um, can you spot the only person who's not conforming to the school rule of wearing a tie? Um, anyway, so this talk is, uh, is about why Python, why the Python community in the UK um, have engaged uh, with the educational world. And it's also sort of a practical demonstration of how we engaged in the educational world. Um, but first, uh, I want to start with politics, um, which is sort of in the air at the moment with the general election last year in the UK, uh, last week in the UK, and you've had your own election here in the last few days. Uh, but I don't mean sort of parliamentary sort of politics. Uh, what I want to do is, is, is uh, I want to frame my talk by um, reading you, I guess, uh, what I would call a movement of thought um, from code to education via politics. Um, and hopefully this will explain the motivation behind uh, a lot of the effort that's been happening in the UK. So I'm going to do some PowerPoint karaoke for you now and re read out some of my slides. So uh, Bruce Schneier points out that software itself does not distinguish morality or legality. It is merely capability. Um, yet capability permits certain forms of behavior um, that in turn pose moral, legal, and political questions, requirements, and possibilities. Furthermore, we're engineering a digital world from a certain point of view that is reflected in the capabilities of the code that we create. And it is for this reason that writing software is both an ethical and political activity. And so what I want you to do if you're a software developer is to ask yourself about your own project's capabilities and work out how it influences and empowers or diminishes perhaps your users. And uh, what I would like to do is encourage you, um, if possible, to promote autonomy. A bit of a philosophical technical word there. Um, so what exactly do I mean by autonomy? Well, when someone is autonomous, they are self-directing, uh, free to act of their own accord and lack imposition from others. Um, autonomy also suggests intelligence and awareness enough to be able to enjoy and make use of, of the freedom that, that you have. And furthermore, uh, such intelligence entails decision making. Um, so people become accountable for their actions. Okay? If you're autonomous, we can hold you to account. Um, and autonomy is also the opposite uh, of such undesirable states as, as tyranny, slavery, ignorance, 
and apathy. Um, I don't think anyone really wants to be any of those things. Um, so um, let's move autonomy into the digital world, as it were. So this is my first computer. Um, I'm not sure whether you had these computers uh, in France, uh, but this is a BBC microcomputer. It's an 8-bit machine from the 80s. I was a child of the 80s. Um, and the BBC Micro uh, is a classic example of trying to promote autonomy. Um, David Allen, the project's producer, I'm going to read a quote for you. Uh, David Allen, the project's producer, explained that um, the aim was to democratize computing. Uh, we didn't want people to be controlled by computers, but we wanted people to control the computers. So in the 1980s, um, every primary school in the United, every school, sorry, in the United Kingdom was given a BBC microcomputer. And it just so happened that my father was a head teacher, uh, my mum was a teacher as well, and uh, one school holiday, my dad brought back the BBC Micro um, with a view to learning how this thing worked. And it took about half an hour for my brother and myself to prize it out of his hands and get onto it ourselves and start messing around with it. And so uh, what exactly uh, did that look like? Well. Um, let's just see. I'm looking sideways now, so um, boom, 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 F11, and I go up here, and that is what a BBC Micro looked like, and that's the first thing that I saw when I switched on the computer. So the first thing I did was, is it going to work? Let me try refreshing that. Am I even... Well, it looks like it might have crashed. Let's try again. Pop. Aha. Here we go. A blinking cursor. So, there I was, eight or nine years old. <laughs> I switch on my computer. I get a cursor, and the first thing I type is hello, because I'm British. And, of course, that was a mistake. Um, <laughs> And it was then that I realized that I needed to know how to communicate with the computer. And over the course of the first weekend, um, I, I, I figured this out we, along with my brother. And uh, we, we, we got into the manuals that, that came with the microcomputer. And we discovered that there were some examples. And so essentially, we did um, a very manual version of cut and paste. And um, I'm going to show you the first program that I wrote by myself on this computer. Okay, so uh, this was based on a fragment of code. I think it said, hello, how are you, um, in, the, in the manual. But uh, I changed it. I changed the string on line 20 to, you are an idiot. And then I called my brother in and did that. And at that moment, obviously I had a bit of a chuckle, but at that moment I realized that I could do things to make the computer do cool stuff. Okay? And... I don't know about you, those of you who are programmers, how many of you have uh, experienced that first, can you remember back to your first experience where you thought, I know how to make this computer, just put your hands up if you can remember an experience like, yeah, okay, so, it's a very empowering feeling, isn't it, when you realize, I'm going to make it stop doing that because I feel a bit uncomfortable calling you all idiots in the middle of a keynote, but there we go, okay, so my first computer, let's make it big again, there we go, I'm back to here. And so, um, and so uh, you know, the, the important thing is that in the 80s, there were an awful lot of British children who had this experience, and a lot of us have now gone on to become programmers, okay? Um, so why is this important? Uh, why is education important? Um, well, I got into a discussion with some people on Facebook about this, um, and this is the answer that, that I gave to them. And so asking what sort of education and learning our community supports is how we decide what sort of community we become. For it is through education and learning that we engage with our future colleagues, friends, 
and supporters. So the reason all of you should be interested in education is because the people you'll be working with in 10 or 20 years' time are those people who are at school at the moment. And if we make a good job of helping these people become good programmers, then we're going to have good colleagues, aren't we? Okay? So that's the selfish way of, doing, uh, of thinking about it. But um, why is education important? Because learning Python is one way to promote digital autonomy, okay? that empowerment feeling that I was just talking about with the BBC Micro. And we want beginner programmers to learn about I don't know, our wonderfully diverse and international community that, that builds things as uh, using a, a model of open collaboration. I think that this is a wonderful thing that we do in the Python community, and it's something that we should spread. Um, and so, how have the UK Python community engaged in education uh, to further this aim? So, part two of the keynote, people. We've done politics, now we're on to people. Um, so, uh, just as in France, we have a, a PyCon UK. Um, and that started out as a conference for developers. And um, when John Pinner, the late John Pinner, um, who sadly passed away a few years ago, um, realized that I used to be a teacher, he said, why don't you do an education thing at, uh, at PyCon UK? And this was back in 2011, I think. And so we invited uh, teachers um, and kids um, to come along to, uh, to PyCon UK, to two days. One's a teacher's day, uh, one's a, child, a, a kid's day. And um, I'm going to explain to you what we do in each of these days. So um, just so that you know, teachers, um, who are teachers? Put your hands up if you're a teacher. OK, fantastic. Teachers, teaching is the one profession that creates all the other professions. Teachers are very important people. So if, you're a if you've had your hand up, by the end of this slide, I want you to feel like you're seven foot tall or something like that. Uh, teaching is a calling, though. You're not doing it for the, for the perks or the money or the fast cars and things like that. It's certainly not um, um, a, a rock star lifestyle. And um, having been a teacher, I was a teacher about seven years uh, during my 20s. Um, it was the most difficult job I've ever done. And for those of you who are programmers and think, well, yeah, programming's stressful. Um, you know, the server's gone down. Ah, our website's offline. I've got clients calling me and things like that. That is nothing compared to a group of 30 16-year-olds um, staring at you um, in a suspicious sort of a way when you walk in and you say to them, I'm sorry, your regular teacher isn't here. Um, I know you've never met me before, but uh, I'm going to be taking your maths lesson, and I'm a music teacher. So um, <laughs> teaching is a difficult job, um, and we should appreciate our teachers. And so here's, uh, here's the uh, photo taken at the end of the first Teachers Day at Pygon UK. I'm sat there on the floor at the front. Um, um, well, what did we do? And so this is me giving you some ideas for perhaps something that you can do next year at Pi Paris, um, or, or maybe in, in PyCon France. Uh, we got teachers and developers together in the same room, is essentially what we did. Um, and we gave a beginner's Python tutorial, where we had teachers sit down as students. Um, I led the tutorial, and we used the developers as teaching assistants. And um, to be honest with you, that first day we thought, okay, this is going to be quite simple. Everybody's going to know what they're doing. They're adults and blah, 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 blah. Um, but it took about, I don't know, 30 seconds to realize that school laptops are locked down and they use old versions of Windows and they use Internet Explorer 6, or they did back in 2011. Um, so we couldn't, we couldn't even install Python on some of these machines, nor could we use services like Python anywhere because that only works with Internet Explorer 7 or more, you know. So, um, we realized that there were lots of problems um, with even just the equipment that teachers use. Um, and then we did, after the Python tutorial, um, we got teachers and developers to sit together and solve some problems. So the teacher would write on a post-it note, uh, sort of brainstorming, a problem that they might have in their classroom or uh, something that they would really love to teach their students. And we would buddy them up with um, with a developer. And so, for example, I wrote a text-based adventure game with, with a, a group of three uh, developers. And over the course of the afternoon, we would hack together and they would be able to see what a software developer does. And interestingly, developers got to see how teachers think about these sorts of things 
because often software developers, I don't know about you, um, but I was, uh, you know, I was usually in the top set at maths and science and English, and I did well at school, and I was a good boy, and I didn't misbehave, and blah, 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 all that sort of stuff. And so we have a very skewed opinion of what education is going to feel like. Um, it's generally a positive experience for people who are developers because we've managed to get through the education system and get degrees and get good jobs and blah, 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 things like that. Um, but, uh, and I speak from experience here, when you're working in an inner city school in, uh, in London um, and you're talking to uh, people who are uh, children who are refugees from a war zone who have uh, no English um, and um, who, who have come to school traumatized, um, it's a very different situation and yet you still have to teach music in my case or, or computing um, in, in our colleagues' cases up there, okay? So um, it was an interesting learning experience for the developers to find out just what sort of things happen in classrooms because it isn't really typically what, um, what we might remember from school. Um, and so uh, the important thing is, is that teachers went away and they kept in touch with developers and the developers kept in touch with the teachers. And so in this photograph we have, so the gentleman in the, pur in the purple um, he looks a little bit like uh, what's his face? Who's Iron Man? You know, he's got the um, the beard. Uh, that's Dan Pope um, in the purple shirt, and uh, he writes games. And so he's written a whole library for teachers called Pi Game Zero um, that allows you to introduce the very simple concept of writing a game using Python and Pi Game. Um, and that was written as a direct result of what happened here. And he kept in touch with the teachers who um, who, who he talked to, so he could try out his ideas on them. Um, the, the blonde lady sat uh, or stood above the two people in the purple shirts at the front there. That's Carrie-Anne Philbin. She's now the Director of Education at the Raspberry Pi Foundation. Um, and at this time, she was, a, she was a teacher, and this was her first programming conference. Um, there are quite a number of teachers around the back. Um, so Van Lindbergh is in the middle. He's the uh, direct, um, chair of the PSF, or he was. And so we had lots of people... Making connections is the important thing. So I would just say, if you're going to do something like this, just getting brains in the room and doing a very simple activity so that people talk to each other is a very useful thing to do. Um, but of course, education isn't just about the teachers, although they're very important. Um, you have to have children as well. And uh, when we have a children's day at PyCon UK, it's a little bit like having, um, I don't know, a monkey infestation at the conference uh, because you've got all of a sudden children everywhere and they're, they're very excited and they have lots of energy and they ask lots of questions and um, it's not like being in a sensible developer conference where people have like, polite cups of coffee or whatever. People will just come up and talk to you and tell you things about stuff and this is rather mysterious for software developers. Um, and so <laughs> what we do is we run a bunch of classes in the morning, very simple classes. We make them fun. Uh, we make them self-directed learning as well. So it's not, a, it's not what's happening now where somebody stood at the front and they're pointing at things and telling you stuff. There's usually some sort of a worksheet um, that children will follow at their own pace. Uh, we have lots of developers volunteering their time because working with children is actually a lot of fun. The energy and the enthusiasm is there is infectious. Um, and so the developers act as teaching assistants to the kids and they spend an hour learning about, I don't know, using the Python API to program Minecraft, which they think is amazing because everybody loves Minecraft. Or they make a robot or they, they, they do something with a Raspberry Pi sense hat and, and pretend that they're, they're making a space probe so they're sensing things. And we try and use their imagination to get them into programming. Um, and then in the afternoon, we kind of let them loose really, or well, we say, essentially, so you've learned quite a number of things this morning, and now we want you to use your imaginations and come up with a project. It doesn't matter what it is, because it's your project, but just do something, and ask for help. Um, we've got lots of developers in the room, and they would love to help you out. And so we give them about two hours to just do a project, um, and at the end, we have lightning talks, just like we're going to have lightning talks this afternoon. Um, but we have the children giving lightning talks to the rest of the PyCon UK conference. So it's a way for their work and their effort to be celebrated. And it's also a way for them to demonstrate the stuff that they've done to the wider conference. And uh, let's be clear, the children are very imaginative. And so often though that series of lightning talks is the best lightning talks of the whole conference because the things that they present are just amazing. They really are. Um, but while they're working, I, I just want to show you perhaps my favorite series of photos from a PyCon ever. Um, 
And this is typical of what we see during the Children's Day. Um, so there are actually uh, three children in this picture that I want you to pay attention to. Um, <laughs> so uh, on the left we have Amelia, um, and she has just met Will, uh, who's on the right. Will is actually my youngest son. Um, and so they've just met, and they're doing some pair programming together. I think they're trying to get um, a little script to run, a little Python script to run against Minecraft, so that as you walk around the world in Minecraft, uh, you leave a trail of diamonds, uh, which is a, something like a three-line Python um, function or something like that. So it's very, very simple. And they've copied it and typed it. And the kid whose mouth you can see just in the top corner there, I told you it's like a monkey infestation, um, that's my middle child, Sam, the big brother of William. Okay, and. Um, they, they, they've typed their code in, and they're, they're making it work, um, but something's gone, uh, gone wrong. Oh, dear. <laughs> we all know how that feels, don't we? <laughs> but Big Brother Sam has spotted the mistake. I think that one was a syntax error, okay? And here, Sam is pointing out, you've missed the colon at the end of the def blah, blah, blah function line, okay? Okay, so um, they've started it. Is it going to work? Ooh, there's no more syntax error. Wow, look at that. Yes, we've got working code. Now, we've all felt this as developers. It's rather good when you get maybe unit tests passing. Perhaps you don't punch the air like that when your unit tests pass. But the important thing is, is that we've created, we've created an environment where children are able to experience that sense of um, achievement and empowerment that I talked about with the BBC Micro. Um, and the most important, well, not the most important thing, a key aspect of this is that we make it very easy for developers to engage in this process as well, and so that they share their information and their enthusiasm so they act as mentors as well. So, um, so what exactly are we teaching um, teachers and kids at PyCon UK? I know we're doing Python, I mentioned Minecraft and things. Um, but um, what we're trying to do is, is help them learn programming, Python programming. And um, a couple of years ago, well, 2015, um, the BBC decided after the success of the Raspberry Pi that they wanted to contribute to uh, computing education in the UK. And um, they created a project called the Microbit Project. And um, for the rest of this talk, I'm, I'm going to talk about that. Um, there's a lot more happening in the UK. There's the Raspberry Pi Foundation, for example, doing a lot of work. But um, the micro bit is, is, is kind of a good example of what we've been up to. Um, so I'm going to try and play you a video, and I want to see if um, I'll just have to hold the microphone near my speaker here, and you'll be able to hear it. Uh, but this was run on BBC television channels throughout the summer of last year. In, in the future, hold the shoes, hit button, hologram of your nan comes up. She also like a map in front of you. Inside the fabric is Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi? Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, that gives me an idea. You know her shoes? Trampolini shoes, shoes that would hover. That is rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we, we handed out a million devices. Um, and the whole point was uh, we wanted to rekindle that sense of wonder that, uh, that we saw with the BBC Micro and we saw at, at, at PyCon UK. Um, and we wanted to foster a sort of a can-do uh, rather than consumer attitude to, to computing. Um, and um, essentially for, for those of us involved in the Python aspect of things, we wanted to sort of cherish creativity and playful exploration rather than perhaps a more formal educational system because um, after the 1980s and the early 90s, um, the UK's uh, computing curriculum turned into sort of Microsoft Word 101 um, or how to make a PowerPoint presentation and things like that. So um, the actual computer programming wasn't part of the curriculum until just a couple of years ago. Um, so. Um, we have a device called a microbit. Um, it runs a version of Python called MicroPython, um, which is uh, created by a friend of mine called Damien George, an Australian physicist who, in his spare time, 
um, wondered whether you could write a version of Python that would run on microcontrollers, and it turns out you, you can. Um, <laughs> and so he's an incredibly talented uh, developer. Um, and the two of us got together and tried to work out, well, what is it that we need um, to make this work uh, for children. Um, there are obviously other platforms available for the micro bit, for example, from Microsoft. Um, but I'm obviously, this is a Python conference, so I'm going to talk about the Python things. And so um, we needed a, a cross platform editor so that children could uh, write code in an easy to use environment. Um, we needed tools for the command line, so uh, developers and teachers, and perhaps those a bit more advanced, would be able to work with it in a, in a more powerful sort of a way. Um, we needed projects to inspire uh, others. And uh, we needed a website about Python education as well. Um, so we got to work, and I guess between 60 to 80 volunteers throughout the course of the whole project were involved, uh, some as young as 11, um, to, to help us um, bring this about. So everything I'm about to show you, and here's the nuclear explosion, Mr. Cameraman, um, Everything I'm about to show you uh, has been created by volunteers, and um, obviously there's a nuclear explosion, and that means um, it's a live demo time. <laughs> so I'm going to be typing and talking, so you'll just have to bear with me as I pick up the microphone and put it down and things like that. So. So the problem with it being um, so small oops, is that I can't really hold it up and say, hey, have a look at this, okay? So I'm just going to hold it there like that, okay? And on the front of the device is a 5x5 five five LED matrix, okay, that, 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 that glows red, um, and two buttons. And across the bottom uh, is a, a strip of GPIO pins, okay? And this is how you plug other devices in uh, into the micro bit. Um, on the back... Um, are the various um, uh, parts of the device, um, all labeled. Across the top is a USB, micro USB um, uh, port, um, so that's how I'm connecting it to my laptop and how, uh, how I program it. Um, there's also a battery pack as well, um, a, a reset button, there's a compass, an accelerometer. Um, you might notice that there's a little aerial on there, so these are capable of a very simple um, uh, wireless uh, protocol into device communication. Um, and uh, so, so that's what a micro bit looks like. So how do you program a micro bit? Well, um, <laughs> let's see. I'm terrified now. So, uh, this is an editor that I wrote. It's a native editor written using PyQt. Uh, it's called Mu. There's a joke in there somewhere. Um, and uh, I based the way that Mu works on um, a keynote given by Carrie Ann, um, the lady I mentioned who is now the uh, Director of Education at the Raspberry Pi Foundation. Uh, she gave a keynote at EuroPython a couple of years ago, and she said, you know, nobody uses idle. Um, uh, it's a terrible thing because we spend half our time fielding questions from teachers about how bad idle is. Um, and what I would really like uh, is um <coughs> is an editor that just had very simple yet obvious buttons across the top that let you do just the most basic things possible and a big obvious place where you type code and that's it, really. And so um, one Sunday afternoon, it was raining, and I thought, how hard can this be? And, and Mew was born. Um, and it has several interesting features. Obviously, very basic file, um, on going from left to right, uh, file system-based stuff, um, a way, ways of interacting with the actual device. So flash, when you flash a device, um, you're putting your code onto the, onto the micro bit. So when I flash my device, I'm saying I'm putting my micro Python code onto the micro bit. Uh, files, there's a very simple file system on the micro bit, so that's how you get to it. Um, REPL, um, that button will open the micro Python REPL running on the device. So this is micro Python running on the micro bit. Um, teachers often will have children falling asleep, like I do, at the back of the room because people are bored or they can't see what's going on. So um, they think this feature is amazing. 
Um, who'd have thought? Um, it's very simple, um, but when I demonstrated this for the first time at a Raspberry Pi meetup, the teachers were like coming up to me afterwards as if I was Jesus, the second coming of Jesus. This was amazing. All of a sudden, children at the back of the room will be able to see the code that I'm talking about. But even more important is that often in schools you have um, projectors that are like 10, 15 years old and they're a bit rubbish now. So if we had a high contrast mode, that would be even better. And so this took me, I don't know, 10 minutes to come up with. And so the important thing is, is that we're thinking about accessibility as well. Okay. Um, the final buttons. Uh, so check runs sort of like flake eight on your code and it annotates it with, you know, ah, I see you've forgotten to put the space here and all those sorts of annoying things that, that we, we do. Um, and it's a way of allowing children to get an idea of how to improve the quality of their code. Um, help opens simple help in a web browser and quit obviously quits it. And that's it. And that's all children want, and that's all teachers want, and it's very, very simple, okay? So I've got some examples uh, that I'm going to show you, and um, I'll talk you through this. So um, MicroPython is a full re-implementation of Python 3. So anything you can do in regular Python 3, you can do in MicroPython. But what MicroPython doesn't have is the standard library, okay? Because that would be silly. Um, <laughs> The BBC microbit has 16K of RAM and 256K of flash, okay? So we are talking about a very, very constrained um, device. Um, and the fact that Damien's managed to squash all of Python 3 into it is, is rather remarkable, but not the standard library. But what we have provided is a microbit um, module, and that is how you interact with the hardware. So from microbit, import display, um, display dot scroll hello world with a delay of 100 milliseconds between each frame okay um, and that's uh, what I want you to notice though is that how obvious that API is what do I want to do I want to use the display to scroll hello world across the screen it's almost like saying it in English okay so what I'm going to do is uh, is demo this in action Sorry. That's essentially how you work with a microbit, okay? So uh, another example. Let's go to the next tab. Okay, blah, 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 blah. So uh, we, can, we can animate things. So um, there's a collection of clock faces. So um, if I uh, flash this, move to that, hold this up, and we should see something that looks like a radar scope when it's finished. There we go. Yeah, okay. So this is, again, time's going backwards. It's like an episode of Doctor Who or something going on here. Um, but <laughs> you, you, have, uh, you have animation working on the display as well. Um, so if you're a child and you have one of these devices, and you can make it say, hello world, uh, you've got to that moment that I had with the BBC Micro, you know, that you are an idiot. You know, this essentially the first thing children will do as soon as they realize they can scroll rude messages across this screen. That's what they're going to do. Um, the important thing is, is that that's given them the, aha, I'm in control of this moment, this motivation to continue. Um, it's not uh, very hard to make something that looks really quite like a game. Um, so this is Sparkle Pictures. We have a bunch of built-in images here, um, and essentially what I do, we, we're very explicit, we have a kind of like an event loop from line 14, um, and I choose a random X and Y, a random brightness, and I set a pixel um, on the screen, so this makes it kind of blink and flash, okay, it looks very cute. Um, but again, look at how we've tried to write the API. Uh, if button A was pressed, <laughs> it's almost like saying it in English, uh, Use the display to show a random choice from the images collection, okay? So show any of the images, then sleep 500 milliseconds, but if button B was pressed, scroll hello world like we've just done. Um, we have an accelerometer that can detect gestures, so if, uh, if we shake the device, show the angry face, so you'll, you'll get an angry micro bit. 
which is what everybody wants. So let's flash the device again. See what that does. Flash. Bum, bum, bum. So there's the device. So the 11-year-old contributed all those pictures, by the way. That's... Uh <laughs> World Hello. And... Arr, an angry microbit. Okay, so I've started the REPL, and um, so this is MicroPython running on the micro bit, okay? Not my laptop. So it's standard Python 3. I can't see what I'm typing, so you'll just have to bear with me. And I'm only typing with one hand. Did that work? Yes, it's just like normal Python, okay? And the important thing is that I can start to play around with the device now. I don't have to write some code, flash the device, see whether it works or not, and then have to start again. I can use the REPL to play around with Python and live code, okay? So what I'm going to show you is, um, uh, it is something very close to my heart. Um, I helped build the music module. So um, we use the REPL to explore the sound producing capabilities of the microbit now. So this is a very simple speaker. And crocodile clips. I feel like a magician at the moment. You know how I have with me. Look, no sleeves. Okay, so essentially all I've done is plug in the, uh, the jack plug um, using the crocodile clips to the ground and the GPIO pin zero um, on the micro bit. So let's see what I can do. Um, all right. Notice the auto-completion when I press tab. Damien is a genius. Okay, when you tune an orchestra, the oboe plays a concert A, which is at 440 hertz. So if this works, mm -hmm. we'll hear an A. Ha! You can imagine the Paris Conservatoire now, can't you? Just tuning up to that beautiful sound. <laughs> <laughs> So I can play a pitch at a particular uh, cycle. Um, so what else can I do? Well, um, all I need really to have fun with this is, uh, is a source of numbers. So let's try that. Strangled cat. <laughs> OK, 
Okay, so imagine it's a Friday afternoon, it's raining outside, and you have a class of 30 children, and your exercise for so that afternoon is making a micro bit into a musical instrument. And essentially, all I did, it's very simple, isn't it? Um, I get the, uh, um, the value of the, 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 the rotation along the x-axis, and I just push that number into pitch, and we get it's sort of a sound, okay? Um, that doesn't sound particularly nice, does it? So uh, let's try something else. So I've written some tunes that are now built into MicroPython. So somebody choose one of these. Wah, 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 OK. I say, I say, I say, I say. Why did the chicken cross the road? To get to the other side. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> the important thing is, is that wah 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 wah. It's a joke telling application. Jump up, jump down, baddie, birthday, ringtone, power up, punchline. Um, Chase, funeral, these are all melodies that you can use to articulate different events in a game, okay? So kids don't have to compose their own music, it's sort of built in, but what does this music look like? Oh. It's just a tuple of notes, it's very easy, it starts with on an E, there's a rest, there's a D sharp, there's a rest, there's a D, and so on, okay? And it's very easy to, to learn how to, to program music. Um, so I have about five minutes left, I believe, so I'm going to be very, very quick here. Um, but making music isn't just the only thing that you can do that's to do with audio. Um, some of you may have heard of Mark Shannon. He's a Python core developer, uh, and he lives about, I don't know, a 30-minute drive away from me. Uh, he's a very talented gentleman. Um, and the two of us were talking about how the micro bit, it kind of looks like a face if you think about it. It's got two eyes with the buttons and, and the teeth across the bottom of the GPIO pins and so on. And so we were talking about, well, how could you make the micro bit sort of a bit more um, anthropomorphic, okay? And so this is what we came up with. Um, let me just uh, deal with things here a second. So, um, between us, we found an old Commodore 64 speech synthesizer that somebody had reverse engineered into C, um, and it wasn't very big, and so Mark did the impossible. Good. <laughs> now, remember I had You Are an Idiot, and then we had scrolling across the display, you are an idiot. So what's the first thing a child's going to do when they realize that they can make a device talk? They're going to be rude with it, but that's okay, because it shows that they are engaged with the device, and they're gonna work out, well, how on earth does this work, okay? And um, so we can do lots of interesting things with the speech synthesizer now. So I have a poem generator here. Um, I say this is my Dalek poetry generator. Um, what it does, um, we have some locations, actions, objects, and props. 
and, and a result. And then underneath, this is just like normal Python. Um, there's a poem. It's a limerick. And then all I do is, uh, is I say it, okay? So let's see, some, an example of Dalek poetry, um, Flash. Mm. So this will run as soon as the, the, the code's been dropped onto the device. So I, I had changed the way the voice sounded. Um, perhaps I should have made it a bit easier to understand. Uh, but that's not all you can do. Um, uh, you, c you can use phonemes as well uh, and to make it sing. I'm not going to do this because I'm running out of time. Um, but um, obviously HAL 9000 sang. Um, and so uh, I managed to recreate that on the micro bit. Again, using phonemes, children make the device say rude things, try and work out how it works. That takes you to how do phonemes work and parts us. So we have phonemes, these are parts of speech. We also have pitch numbers at the beginning, which tells you how to change this. I'm sure you can see it's daisy, daisy, give me your aunt, so then so on and so on, okay? And I'm having to sort of spell it phonetically here. And the way I change the, uh, the, the duration is by just putting more of the things on the end, okay? And it's a bit of trial and error there, okay? Um, so the last thing I want to show you is that uh, the device actually has a radio built in. Uh, this is a little robot here, um, and it has a micro bit on it here, which I've already programmed. And now it's on, it's got a little skull, so I know which one's mine. And then, robot controller. Flash. This is a very simple radio. And the way you send a message with the microbit radio is with on line 65, radio.send message. And on here is an infinite um, loop. Obviously, I'm tilting this. Um, oh, it's not working well on this carpet. It's working better backwards forwards. Oh. There we go. Works better maybe on a hard service, but you get the idea. I'm controlling that micro bit on the robot with that micro bit plugged into here, and I'm using the tilt, the accelerometer, to tell it where to go. Okay? So, there we go. Um, so that ends the demo, and I think I got through it without too much of a disaster going on. <laughs> um, so, this afternoon, I have 30 of these devices. Um, you'll be able to uh, try out one of the worksheets that I used at PyCon UK. Um, come, and, come and have a learn and, and, and have some fun. Um, we don't have time for questions um, because we've run out of time. But please, 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 please come and find me afterwards during the coffee break that was announced because it was seriously gone missing. Um, but at 10.45 when there's the coffee break, um, I will put these slides online and tweet them. And at the very end of these slides, are links to all of the things that I talked about. Okay, that's it. <laughs>